Hey guys, Greg here, Let's Solve Number of Islands, lead code number 200. We are given an M by N 2D binary grid. So binary grid means either ones or zeros, and they're actually represented as strings. So this grid represents a map of ones, land. So all of the ones are land, and all of the zeros are water. And we need to return the number of islands. So an island is surrounded by water and is formed by connecting adjacent lands horizontally or vertically. And you may assume all four edges of the grid are surrounded by water. So in this example here, all of the ones are the land and all of the zeros are water. And we actually have only one island in this example. So our output is going to be one because all of this piece right here, all of these ones here, they're either connected to each other horizontally or vertically. So you can picture this huge chunk of land here. We just have one island. Whereas in this example here, we actually have three islands. So we have one right here, these four pieces. We have this lone land right there. That's another one. And we have our third island here. So it's all of the connected pieces of land. Okay, so this is a graph problem because basically all of the ones are vertices in the graph. So we're just going to draw circles around these. All of these are vertices. All of the zeros are basically just useless. We don't really care about those. And we want to connect all of the ones together here. Okay, so this is our connected graph. If you were to draw it out, we'd have these three connected components. Basically, we just want to return the number of connected components in the graph, which is three. Now, in some graph problems, you might have to go and create the graph, but in in this one, we really just already have it here. So if this graph has M rows and N columns, well, then there's M by N different positions here. So we'd have 0, 1, 2, 3. Those are our valid rows. And our valid columns are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So we're going to have a total of 5 times 4, which is 20 different positions here. So there's 20 different combinations of IJs, and we're going to have to iterate over the grid. So we'll have to look at this position. I'll have to look at this position, and we'll look at it kind of in the this zigzag order right here. Okay, so let's just say we have a total of zero islands so far. This is the thing we want to return here, the total number of islands, and we would iterate over the grid. So the first position we'd look at here is zero, zero. Now this is a one, so we don't want to ignore it. If it was a zero, then we'd really have nothing to do with it, but it's a one, so we want to pay attention to this. Now we want to say, okay, well, we have a one. We have one more island than we used to, but we don't just want to keep our iteration going here by looking at then the next position, because then he'd say, oh, we have another one. We have two. No, that's not correct here. When we see this first one, we need to eliminate all of this different stuff here. So we'd start a DFS traversal at this guy. And before he does anything else, we want to mark it as a zero. Okay, so we want to say we never want to visit this thing ever again. That's important because when we look at its connections, we would end up actually carrying on the traversal. We'll say that we go right first. So we'll look at him. Well, we don't want this traversal to last forever because we don't want this guy to say, oh, do we have one over here? If we kept this as a one, then they keep kind of going backwards over and over again. And you could also use a hash set for this to kind of keep track of visited positions, but we don't have to. We're marking the grid so that anywhere we visited already, we're going to mark that as a zero. So that way, when he goes to his neighbors here, both of they will be marked as zeros. We then mark their neighbors and this guy will also get marked as a zero. So that way we finish this search here. We had marked that we we saw one land and we're actually just eliminating that completely. So it just destroys that island. And that makes it so that when we carry over our iteration here, when we look at this position and do a DFS, we get nothing, which is totally ideal because we've already used up this whole island here. So now what happens is we iterate over this grid. We're seeing nothing. We're seeing nothing. Oh, we see one. We're going to say we have one more island than we did before. We are just going to immediately mark that position as a zero. So that's nothing. He does his search, but none of these find anything interesting. And so we keep going on our iteration. We find one here. We do a DFS. We mark this as a zero. Its neighbor is going to find that as a zero. Nothing else. None of these are going to find any positions. And we'd also have marked that we saw one more island. So we got our total of three. This is our last position in the grid. So when we go through this, we would basically exit our for loops and we could then return our result, which is three. 
So if this grid had m rows and n columns, well, we'd be iterating over m times n positions. So our time complexity would be at least big O of m times n. Now we also have some searches in there, but think about this. If we had an island that's crazy, something like this, for example, well, yes, when we see here this position, we would actually go and visit all of these, but that is at most an m times n. And there's no way we'll ever do a search for these again. Whenever you hit one piece of the island, particularly when you hit the top left corner of the island, it's going to visit all of those. They'll be marked as zeros so that we never do that again. So basically, if you're iterating over the grid, you see your m times n things, all of your searches combined could do a total of m times n again. If the entire grid was ones, for example, your DFS would do that m times n there, except you would never do it again. So the rest of the iteration over here, you're not going to do any of that stuff again. So the overall time complexity of this, it's basically O of 2 times m times n, which is definitely just O of m times n. Now the solution is almost constant space because we actually overwrite the initial grid here. However, there's really no way to do a search without using extra space. If you implemented this via a DFS, well, you could either use a recursive call stack and that would have a depth of m times n here. So you'd have a potentially the whole grid on the call stack. If you did an iterative DFS, so you basically use a stack, for example, so an iterative stack here, again, you would store at most m times n things on the stack. And if you instead used a BFS, well, for that, you have to use a Q. And as well, that would take at most M times N things. So there's really no way to get this to be constant space, uh, but we did the best that we could. So that's also going to take up at most M times N. So if the grid had m rows and n columns, then we could get the length of the grid as m, so that's how many rows we have, n, or the number of columns we'd have, is the length of the grid at zero. And I'm choosing at zero, it could have been kind of any of these lengths here, uh, but we're guaranteed at least that you have kind of one position here. m and n are at least one. So we'll say the length of the grid itself is m, and the length of the very first row is going to be n, which is the number of columns. Now I'm going to write a very small amount of our DFS function. This takes two parameters i and j, and it's going to, for now, just pass. So basically what this DFS is going to do is, given a position, it's going to traverse and mark that entire land as water. So it just takes one of these things, and it's going to go and find everything that it can. In this example, basically the whole island there, or all of the islands, because there's just one island, and it's going to turn it all into water. Now before we write that here, let me just show you how we can use it. So if if we have zero islands so far, we'll just say that we have zero, then for each i in the range of m, and for all of those, for j in the range of n, that's going to traverse the board in this fashion, like we saw in the example. Well, then we have every single position ij here. We're only interested in the ones. So if the grid at ij is equal to a one, yes, they're actually strings, by the way. I don't know why they made them strings, but they are. If the grid at ij is a one, well, then we have one more island than we used to. So we have num islands is going to go up by one. However, to make sure that we don't don't double count. We don't want to count this guy again on the next iteration. We need to turn all of that connected component into water. So we run a DFS on IJ. We only need to do that if it is a one. If it is a one, we are going to go and turn that whole thing into water. Okay, so let's turn it into water. It's actually really not that bad. Now, the main parts of these functions are determining the edge cases, and there's a lot of them, but it's basically always the same thing. You'll get comfortable with this line very much. So pay attention a lot here. If I is less than zero, that means that your row index is basically basically too high here, so that's not going to work. Or i is at least m. So basically, if the valid rows are 0 to m minus 1, well, then if you're m, that means you're out of bounds this way. You're basically at the bottom, so that's not going to work. And very similar things for the column. Or it's true that j is less than 0, so that would mean you're too far to the left. Or it's true that j is, try and guess it here, j is at least n. If you have n columns here, your valid indices would be 0, 1, 2, up until n minus 1. And so if you're at n, that basically means you're out of bounds on the right. Okay, if all of these are through, then we're guaranteed to be a valid position in the board. However, even if you're a valid position, we only care about you if you are a 1. So or the grid at ij is not equal to a 1. So if any of these things are true, we don't care about this position. And so you can 
simply just return. Otherwise, we do care about this position, and particularly, it is a valid position in the grid, and that position is a 1. So if this isn't true, it means we're particularly at an IJ, which is a 1. So we need to do two things as we saw. We need to set your own position, grid at IJ, equal to a 0. And then we also need to do a DFS on all of its connections. So that's just simply running DFS on, well, you could go to the right. So DFS on I and then J plus 1. That's why we need this is because we're trying to say, like, if you're here, you know, don't go actually over here. So DFS on the right, we could do DFS on the bottom, so I plus 1 and J. We could do left, DFS on I and J minus 1, and we could go up, DFS on I minus 1 and J. So write this down and make sure you understand. This is going right, this is going down, this is going left, this is going up. Make sure you understand why. And that is actually all there is to it, believe it or not. You can actually just go ahead and return the number of islands that we got, and that is going to work. Okay, so as we said here, the time complexity is going to be big O of M times N, where M is the number of rows, N is the number of columns. So the total number of elements in the grid, O of M times N, and the space complexity of this, as we saw, O of M times N. Usually both of these things are going to be true for these types of problems. Okay, I hope this was helpful, guys. Drop a like if it was, and have a great day. Bye-bye.